Right on, and welcome back to the Reckless Podcast. My name is uh, Cody Stortz, uh Chef Roger on tour, and uh, officially, I guess, like a uh, host of the show now, huh? I guess that's how it works. Yep. I guess that's how it goes, right? All right. And uh, we're about to try some uh, cake bread, no? Yeah. What's going on, man? I, I want you to talk about what we have in here. I, I, this wine I know very little about. I've had cake bread Chardonnay numerous times. I've had, never had your reds. Um, and I know that there's like, it kind of has like the unicorn effect where people <laughs> let go. Why is it so expensive? Why is this Chardonnay? so expensive right and so yeah uh when i tried it i went oh it's good you know but i don't know anything about it or why in and, and why anything so what's up dude totally so cake bread started in 72 and and the cool story about that is it kind of started on a whim so if we get kind of into the story with jack cake bread you know he's basically a mechanic has a, a family auto shop in oakland um on his spare time basically he you know liked to do photography got really good caught the eye of a a really well-known photographer named ansel adams um and basically, yeah, just a little guy. Just a little guy he, you know? didn't, he didn't do much in the world. <laughs> Definitely not. Um, some people still don't know who he is. So uh, basically, he's commissioned to um, kind of photograph the emerging wine industry uh, in Napa. And about that time, there's probably like nine wineries in the early 70s. And so he's coming up from Calistoga and uh, decides to visit a family friend of his, uh, the Sturdivants in uh, Rutherford, basically. So he, he's stopping by. He notices they have a for sale sign. It's 22 acre property. You know, they're an older couple, don't have any kids. So he starts talking to him, hanging out, and uh, you know, throughout the whole time he was kind of bragging about his, you know, twenty five hundred dollar commission check from Ansel Adams, right? And so he was like, you know, I've always thought about you know owning something like this for property for my kids. He's got two older boy, uh, two boys, actually three boys, uh, two of them that are in the winery. Um, and he was like, yeah, I would love to buy this property, but I don't have any money. And they were like, well, you've been bragging about this twenty five hundred dollar check, right? And why don't we, do, you know, figure this out, uh, put it down as a da uh, deposit, basically, and down payment, and we'll go from there. And he goes, okay. So he's driving home and back then obviously there's no cell phone there's no pager you know uh he gets home to oakland and his wife greets him like any other wife and goes hey jack how are you how was your day and he goes oh it was a good day and, you know did you do anything out of the ordinary and he goes no nothing crazy so she goes you didn't happen to buy a winery did you and he goes oh you know like i've been meaning to tell you and so she kind of laughs and goes well you know hopefully it didn't back out because they've already accepted our offer and what's crazy about that when you think about real estate and uh prices now in napa right napa is going down for a million dollars an acre and he buys a 22 acre property for 2,500 bucks, and, basically. And escrow closed in like three hours. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Holy cow. So it's kind of crazy. And I, I think his wife got back at him. So, you know, she originally um, set out four p uh, acres of property uh, right in the middle of the heart of the actual vineyard itself, or well, the property itself before it was vineyards and planted her own organic garden. So that's kind of cool. So uh, you talk about food and wine and you talk about the whole idea about cake bread and everything is all about quality everything is always uh centered around the whole idea of, of food and it still is like so the main property the main winery uh the main building in rutherford still has that you know that property that organic garden and we always joke about it being some of the most expensive you know tomatoes basically coming out of napa basically you yeah know, right a million dollars an acre those are really expensive tomatoes <laughs> that's a hell of a salad dog definitely <laughs> that's awesome so getting into the cake bread chardonnay uh what makes them kind of unique is that uh they're very consistent you know everybody kind of has been making wines, uh, especially you know, in the 80s and 90s, you see people uh, making it towards uh, publications or making it towards consumer trends. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of hard because like anything else, restaurant-wise, everybody kind of comes in, trends fade and go and whatnot. And it's the consistent people that are the ones that kind of go through and are almost timeless in a sense. Uh, so the Cake Bridge Chardonnay definitely had its its phase where it decided to go the big oak and, and butter kind of style for a little bit in the 90s. Uh, following Rombauer basically. So Rombauer is kind of like the big Chardonnay, always has been that big Chardonnay uh, name that everybody kind of gravitates towards. Uh, and Cake Bread's always kind of been, you know, the second one right behind it. Uh, you know, even in Orange County where this is basically Chardonnay capital for the country, you know, all the housewives drinking their Chardonnay during the days, it's, uh, you know, Rombauer's <laughs> number two, one, Cake Bread's number two. And it's, right. it's interesting to see that, how they kind of do that. But, and it's one of those things where they both have been, you know, criticized, you know, one way or the other, but they've kind of stuck to their guns. And, um, you know, the Carneros fruit has always been a, a Chardonnay centric, you know, area for Napa. So for those that don't know, Carneros is, uh, right as you get into it, you know, it's, uh, Southwest Napa basically, and it borderlines, you know, Sonoma and Napa side, Napa has the bigger side of, of the Carneros, but it's right off that San Pablo Bay. So you get that cool fog, uh, helps keep the acidities, uh, within the grape itself. So that's kind of the whole part about this. And then, you know, you get into just consistency and quality. Um, we can get into that a little bit later on about sure, man. Uh, what makes cake bread cake bread, but definitely. So, so here's the other question, man. Uh, you know, what, why are you selling this stuff, dude? I mean, what, what, what did, what, what did your past lead you into wine? I mean, that, 
I, I have a lot of questions about cake bread. We'll Please, get yeah. to that. But uh, but what about you, man? Like, I mean, you get here. I get people on the show all the time. Uh, are you a restaurant guy? Did you did you work in the in the slums with us or what, Absolutely. man? What, what so, happened, dude? So, did you did you throw down in the, in uh, Nam totally. or what happened, bro? Uh, totally. So I I grew up passionate. So I'm a sommelier. Uh, passion has always been in the restaurant side. Um, the wine side of things kind of happened basically around uh, when the economy started going to shit and being a beverage director in Assam just didn't make sense in 2008, right, 2009, that, right? So I'm like, Does that hit home at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> anybody that was in the high-end business, talk about it. yeah, anybody that hit home in the high-end business like, oh, that's the butt pucker, the yeah, re-butt re pucker, that's what that is. So I, I grew up working in restaurants, 16, 17, uh, worked at a really cool little Italian deli where, um, you know, we opened up in a high-end Italian restaurant where I grew up. Um, took over the bar program just because like true t traditional Italians doesn't trust anybody else. And he was a family friend. He's like, Hey, you're 20 years old. You don't know shit, but I want you to run my bar program. So I kind of started studying. Um, the cool thing about that. I was at Cal Poly Pomonum. So I had no idea about the restaurant school that was part of that program. I just used to make fun of all those fuckers that were walking up the hill and their <laughs> chef hats and they, these weird little checkered pants. And I'm going, you guys are idiots. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they still are. Still I'm, definitely I'm, are. I'm, 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 hey, I'm I one of those idiots. Yeah, Come me, on, me man. Me too. Me too. Come me on. too. I, I still have hands tooth that I had in the back of my pants just for you know. I'm a proud Cal Poly gr gr grad. Are you? Did Cal you? You went? Nice. I, can't, Cal I, I didn't. I didn't go to Cal Poly, but I wore the stupid pants. Cal State Florida expelled me, and then I well. went to Cal Poly and uh, got in that program. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Good. The calling school is cool. Yeah. So you know, it was one of those things where that all of a sudden you know I'm t just turning 21 at this program now, and uh, we were one of the few schools in the country at that point that actually had the uh, beer and wine as a curriculum. So I'm 21 years old, and I'm going. Well, who doesn't want to drink for an A, right? Yeah, yeah, that's well, that's yes, yeah, what I did. My first wine class, I was just hammered by the third glass. Oh, absolutely. The other seven tasted great. <laughs> what well, was crazy? So I got kind of lucky. So I kind of had this passion to try to understand wine. Uh, I was one of the few students. There was me and another kid um, that we were actually able to do all four uh, wine, beer, and wine classes, and spirit classes in one whole quarter, and we got this huge lecture from everybody saying, "Okay." If you ever get an accident, because we're up on a hillside, and you have to go down a you know windy hill to go down to the regular part of the school. Right. They're like if you get an accident going down on school, you're kicked out of school. If you get an accident outside of school, you're kicked out of school. We were both running restaurants at this point, you know, drinking in the restaurants. You're 21 years old and running a bar, you know, bartenders whatnot. So we're drinking all day long too, and we're kind of going, okay, how do we you know keep ourselves from doing it? Plus, we had a restaurant in between our classes during the day. So you'd have you know one two classes in the morning drinking. You'd have a restaurant where you drink beer and wine, and then one or two more classes during the day, and you're just hammered. And then go to your restaurant hammered and get even more hammered. So it was kind of a fun little you know quarter for me. But that was it. And what really turned me on to the wine side was uh, the two professors were uh, president and vice president of LA County for a wine competition. So for extra credit, we got um, to go help out and do the judging, the actual behind the scenes stuff. And I met you know. Fred Dame, who was a master sommelier, Brian Julian, who was actually the guy that created the court for, of master soms in, in uh, the UK, and you know, hanging out with winemakers and wine critics like Rebecca Chapa, and, and everybody's partying, and you're kind of going, well, who the hell doesn't want to do this for a living? Make yeah, 150K and drink. Yeah, what you know? a bum gig. Yeah, exactly. It sucks. So that kind of set me going on to being uh, a wine guy. My dad was a huge Napa, Col Colt Napa wine drinker. Uh, still, for the most part, only drinks his Colt Napas uh, and old school stuff. You know, I grew up on Louis Martini's. Mm -hmm. uh you know old school 68 we still have them in the house where there's you know drink a 68 you know barbera basically going there's no way in hell this wine is good and for 30 minutes it's the best wine you ever drink and after that it's just vinegar it's piss right but you know you got these winemakers that made stuff that was you know ageable now you kind of go in the whole industry is a whole different you know different animal but that kind of set me off to doing this and then you know worked in restaurants as you know saw them and beverage director in la and orange county and like I said, it was one of those things where I'd met my wife right after I did my advanced uh, exam. Uh, and I met her that week, which was kind of cool. So I remember the, the courting experience of meeting my wife. I have 20 wines every single night on, on a table. You know, I've been you know, studying all day long while she's at work and come over and be like, hey, come over. You know, there's a bunch of wines. I'll make you dinner. And I'm sure she thought, already thought this guy's trying to get me drunk and get in my pants kind of thing, you know? And it's Which one was 100% true. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> was. Yeah, come on now. Never crossed your mind. <laughs> didn't, didn't. I was just being a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh -huh. uh huh. But that was kind of the cool part about it, and it was one of those things that she always talks about. Is like that was kind of what won me over was you know going to this house in, in Newport Beach and seeing a bunch of wine on the table, new wine every day, and you know being cooked you know a meal and whatnot. Um, and then you know going in 2009, I was working at Craft in LA. I was a beverage director out there, and uh, still lived in Newport with my wife. Uh, we were kind of living together, and she was a nine to five, and I'm you know 12 to two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, right. And she's like, this ain't working. Plus you're in LA and you're work, working with, you know, semi, you know, C-list and D-list actresses and stuff like that. And you're, she's like, I just can't handle it. So 
for me, that was kind of like the start of when I kind of got back into the wine business and sales and kind of haven't looked back since. Uh, that's about 99.9% of the reason that everybody leaves the restaurant business, I believe, is it's just too much, man. Yeah. I mean, for family, we do the same thing, right? I, 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 you know, I, you get your time with family when you do. Uh, luckily, you become the owner or whatever, move on, get into another biz uh, that allows you to love the business. However, not work those grueling, grueling, crazy uh, hours. So. Definitely. Well, welcome to this side of the game, dude. I'm, uh, I'm glad you're here. Yep. And uh, I know I, I know nothing about these, so, so let's I'm, get into I'm this. still still a little baffled by and and you brought up Ron Bauer, which is interesting. So Ron Bauer's number one uh, butter bomb, big, you yep. know, cute, cute, whatever in uh, over there over the hill, Chardonnays. But and then this is number two. Yep. Right. Do you think it's because Ron Bauer sells by the glass? So I by mean, the so by the glass price points, by the glass everything, we're, we're always about neck and neck. Okay. Um. Again, it's it stylistically, uh, there's just differences on it. So right. what makes cake bread, cake bread is, is that we're kind of that middle ground style of Chardonnay. And the quality of cake bread is kind of unique. And so, I'll, I'll, like I said, I'll get into that, but I might as well just jump into it. What makes cake bread really cool is um, 2005, the family decided to make a pact with each other. So it's, you know, Jack cake bread, his wife, Dolores, the two sons, uh, Bruce and Dennis. There's a third son that's in finance industry, but has nothing to do with the wine business. Uh, but Bruce and Dennis are kind of in the business and they said, we're never going to make any more wine than we make this year. And at that point, they had 500, a little over 500 plus acres that were all estate. They had a little bit of contract fruit, but for the most part, it's 500 acres. And uh, 2005 was a big vintage for everybody in Napa. So kind of, you know, a flush vintage. And they've kind of kept th true to that with the exception of they've built now another 200 plus 50 acres of estates. And they're still making that same uh, amount of wine that they made back then. Wow. So basically, in terms, if anybody ever hears about uh, winemaking terms, you hear about tonnage per acre, right? That's always kind of like a derivative of quality to some degree or one other. Uh, from a white program to the red program, just to put in perspective, they average under two tons an acre, which is huge, right? Well, well huge in, in, the, in the negative side of things where uh, typically everybody does anywhere from six to ten tons an acre. Right. Unless you're in Temecula and it's like 29 or something. Right? I mean, yeah, yeah. And I've heard these stories and I learned some, but every time somebody brings something, it reminds me of all the stuff I don't know about this. Uh, so, uh, and, and this is in what region? So this is uh, Napa for the most part. And then there's a little bit of their Pinot. They have a Pinot coming from Mendocino County, Anderson yep. Valley. And then they also have a new project, which will kind of, it's outside of cake bread, but it's by, but it's by cake bread uh, in Washington. So the Columbia Valley. So they're kind of a new project that started out in 2012. But for the most part, cake bread is Napa. I mean, it's all across the board Napa. It's like when you taste cake bread stuff, it's basically going from southern part of Carnaris all the way to Calistoga and, you know, side to side, east and west and everything. So uh, they've got a lot of property. They've been doing it slowly. And that's the cool thing about it is uh, anybody that started in the 70s and the 80s, they're able to buy stuff and slowly expand their, uh, into their properties that they own uh, versus like someone coming in right now, you're, you're paying a million bucks an acre, you're spending $10 million for a winery. You're basically... 30 years before you even see a profit if you sell you know a right. couple hundred thousand wines you know at 300 bucks a bottle it's almost impossible to make money yeah if you're lucky to buy good fruit right i mean a lot of time what, if somebody's selling some land they're not selling the best fruit in the world pretty much and right everything, yeah it's it's tough it's uh it's one of those things what do you, where you, what do you guys plan in washington uh so we're doing board override so that's the whole idea with them is is uh, they've always been true to their their nature with planning board uh early on in cake bread's history with the exception of you know chardonnay and sauve blanc which still solve is is uh bordeaux but it's Cab uh, Merlot, Cab Franc, Petit Verdot, uh, and they're as they're growing into this project, they're kind of going almost 100% Cabernet. So they're kind of playing with that idea, just strictly doing Cab and maybe a little Cab Franc. How far is that from being bottled? Uh, so they're they're playing with. So every vintage they get more and more Cab. So 2012 was the first vintage of it. Uh, we we're going to taste a 15 vintage where you're now a little over 50%, mm. and they're kind of slowly playing with those ideas. So 16, 17, 18, they're still kind of in barrels and playing with bottles and whatnot, and they're trying to decide whether or not they want to go almost 100% Cabernet or be, you know, 80% Cab Plus and say it's a Cabernet and, and kind of play with it on that route. Um, cool. So it's a, it's a work in progress. Um, you know, we'll get into those, like I said, as we go. But so getting back to cake bread, so again, with the idea of, of yields, um, the idea is that there's all much, all, that much more energy going into the actual vines because there's so much less of it. And people go, oh, do they sell it off or do they do anything? They sell a tiny bit of it, but again, it's the idea is that they're basically, you know, cropping it so that there's so much sun energy going in, into those different vines and, and making something that's really concentrated and really complex. Right on. Well, I, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I'm going to, because we're going to take a break and then we're going to come back and drink some of this juice. What do you think, man? All right. Reckless Podcast. We'll be right back. <laughs> 